chapter 20, evaluation. Let's see what's going on. My, all right, so, all right, um, what's this chapter about, right? Um, so it's about evaluation. Uh, specifically, well, it's the entire chapter, I would say, is about non standard evaluation, right? So, evaluation we're talking about is that ev ev everything we do in this chapter is we're, we're evaluating coded expressions in custom environments to achieve specific goals. Um, and the fact that we're customizing the environments means that all of these evaluations are non standard, right? And particular emphasis is placed on one type of non-standard evaluation, which is called tidy evaluation. And um, to do tidy evaluation, we make use of the functions in the rlang package, right? And then towards the end of the chapter, he briefly goes over, well, relatively briefly goes over some ways to do non-standard evaluation using, um, you know, using just the functions from base R. Oh. All right, so very basics, right? Um, all right, so we start with the eval, right? Which is a function that evaluates an input expression in an input environment. Um, so eval takes two arguments. Um, okay, so my team is probably not optimal for the, these examples. Maybe you can't see this, all right? But, um, it takes two, two arguments, which are expression, you know, expra, which is an expression and an environment, right? And if, envir if the environment is not specified, it takes the, um, what is it, the global environment as the default, right? So here we have some examples here. We set x to 10, and then we evaluate expression x, and we get this output here, right? Second example is we run this code here, we set y to two, then we evaluate the expression, which is x plus y, and we do it in the environment where we create an environment where x is equal to 1000. This example is straight from the book. Um, so what happens is x plus y, it goes first to the environment, x equal 1000 to get x, and then y goes to the parent, to the parent environment to get 1002. Right. All right. So something to observe, um, which is that the first argument of eval is evaluated, not quoted. So you can get some strange behavior for, you know, let me highlight this, sorry. I, didn't, I hope you all can see it. Um, I, I can switch to our studio. Um, oh yeah, before I switch to our studio, I'd like to apologize to Tan. Um, I did switch my pain layout recently. I'm trying something different. I cannot sold out. Um, but so I can do, right? Let me just copy paste the star studio. All right, sorry. Right. Ooh, that's probably a bad idea. What did I do there? All right, sorry. Yeah, just catching up on the chat. Um, sorry, hmm. please don't pay attention to the chat. <laughs> all right, what did I do there? Okay, all right, so this is the example. All right, let me, let me use the broom here. All right, so here's the example, All right? So the first argument is not quoted, it's evaluated. So you get the print x plus one happening twice, All right? And then this line down here, well, if we quote the expression, if we quote the first argument, we, get, we avoid the double print, right? So I'll take that back to our studio, right? 
Okay. All right. So the chapter, what he, uh, so the way he goes over the chapter is that like, he shows a lot of examples of replicating other functions or functionality in R. Um, so one of the things he uses, well, the first thing he references is local, which I had never seen before, but it's a base R function that allows you to run a chunk of code um, inside its own environment. And like a common use case might be that you want to do a multi-step computation and you want to automatically dispose of the intermediate data, right? So like you do this, this function here, inside local, you have, you know, you do X, you know, you're creating these, these data structures X and Y, you're adding them, which is what you really want. And then, you know, if you hadn't done it inside of local, X and Y would have survived after the loop and it would just be extra, right? Okay, so how do we, how do, how do we replicate local using eval, right? Okay, so how do we do that? So he creates this function local two, which is a function that takes an expression and then um, creates an environment, which is the call environment. And then he, he does the evaluation using an expra of the input expression, the enriched expression in the call environment, right? So, um, so that's local two, which is the alternate. Um, and, then, and then he just uses this function foo. You know, he does local two to do the same example as before. Any, right? What is the context for doing this like in real life? It, it seems pretty cool and useful. Um, I don't know um, if you, you want to get into our core and uh, change the implementation on local, maybe. Um, I, I, I think I, I'm Gwen, and thank you for having this, Darren. But I think I think sometimes you just don't want to have variables hanging around, variable n names hanging around in the environment because you want to, um, you know, you want to call it something else or you want to have several different things. Sometimes environments, I think, can get really, really messy. Yeah, you can also yeah. Be, like, I, I agree. Ramp. Sorry? Like, you might do something that's really RAM intensive and want to clear it out when you're done would be. Uh, yeah, I guess those two use cases, one is like thinking with your developer hat on and one is thinking with like a user hat okay. on to me, you know? Uh, yeah, I mean, I definitely like now that I know about local, I think I'll use it um, because I'm creating exactly. the data all the time. But yeah. I'm not sure that I quite understood that question when you asked, but yeah, I, but yeah, so this is a, this is an alternate implementation of local or it's an implementation of a local like function. Yeah. I meant either of the two, like I've, I've, this is my first contact with them and yeah. it seems pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. So I know now that I know about local, I think I'll use it. All right, so the other, the next example he does is he does two examples of replicating source function. Source is something I'm familiar with. And I think, you know, most people probably are, there's a source button in our studio, right? So he writes this source function, which is a function that takes a path, which is like a string and a end call a name. And then what does he do? I guess let me. I, I guess I could switch to our studio here. So, uh, where am I? So, this here. Um, where am I? Why does that take so long? All right, so let me write a short script here. Um, and
Um, so can I do a debug? Source two of open check the water. All right. So what's going on here? All right. So so file, does that work? All right, so, all right, so that stored file. Yeah, so it got a line. So file contains the one line in my file. Next I can, all right, let me see what the expressions are. Can we do a quick review? Parse expressions is different from evaluating, right? Yeah. Well, so so look at what so expressions. So I'm just looking at the output of expressions here, right? It's a list. Well, in my my script only had one line. Mm -hmm. Right, so it's a list where the first where the first member is the one line in in my script. Got right. it. So, so so that's the output. So let's see if we do a class of example. Right. All right. So it's a call. All right, and. And now I think here's where it evaluates, right? So here's where it evaluates. And if you pretend that my file had more commands in it, we can pretend that um, we've seen source replicated, right? Do we know why res gets assigned and then invisible is called? Um, oh, because he wants it, well, so what does invisible do, right? It returns an invisible copy temporarily. Um, I think because he doesn't want to keep it around unless you explicitly want to keep it around for some reason. I think it's because source is a function that you typically call for the side effect. You know, which is the actual running of your code. You, 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 you don't call source for the return value. Anybody buy that answer? I think it's because if you don't call it invisibly, um, what it will do is return something um, and it will print it to your console if it's not, if source isn't assigned into something, um, yeah. it, will, it will return into your console the last thing, which is the for loop in this case. Okay. Um, right. so whereas if you don't, then um, like if you call invisible, it like it still returns the thing only if you assign it into something. So if you took source two and assigned it to something, it would give give you a copy of res. Okay. Yeah. So so is it 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 just to keep it neat, right? Not to have it well. Oh, but like put all the extra stuff to the screen. All right. Yeah. All right. And, then, and then he does another example, which is source tree, um, which takes advantage of how eval deals with lists, right? So um, so he gives another example where you can just do eval. You can, you can put only lines into a file and then run the eval. So this has the advantage that it's more concise, but you do have to create this intermediate data structure lines as opposed to over here where you don't, right? All right. 
So um, feel free to stop me at any point. All right, so then the next thing he talks about is core shares. I think I'm pronouncing it correctly. Well, I hope I am. Um, so what is a core share? A core share is an encapsulation of, a, of an expression and an environment. Um, is that the coupling of these two things is so important that it was decided that Arlang should provide a composite structure. And when I say important, it means that, well, it's very powerful to, to have them together. And in tidy evaluation, you use it a lot at the time, right? All right, so how do you make them? So Arlang provides three ways. One's using NCO and NCOS. This is the best way. Um, then there's CO and CoS. These are here just to match expra and expras, right? You probably don't need this. And then the third way is using the new Quotia function, which is useful for learning, but you probably don't need this either, right? So some examples. Um, one example I don't think I'm doing correctly, but so the first example is um, so he, 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 the book has a function, but I write a, you know, I use the same function with a different name. So I create, push a create here, right? And then, and then I run it and then push a create A plus B and I get a pusher with an expression and an environment. I tried to, to do a version with NCOS to do a, um, to do it on list of expressions. So I created pushes create, which is a function which um, uses NCOS to what I was hoping would be um, a list of expressions. And then when I ran it, so I ran it like this. Let me, let me go back to our studio. Um, right, so I was hoping to get a list of closures, but I really got one closure with multiple expressions. Shouldn't, shouldn't the, instead of X, there should be dots, and then instead of giving it a list, you just give it dots? Mm -hmm. Oh, all right. That's, uh... All right, that's that, that, that. And do I use you need the dot 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 in the definition or in the function for the C dot dot dot? Oh, okay. All right. Oh, yeah. Yeah, my bad. Oh. Okay, so now I can run this line here. But without the list, just do it as. Okay, dots. just do it. Um, like this is what you mean? Yep. Oh, all right. There you go. There we go. In, in general, the Arlang functions that are plural are basically expecting dots. Okay. or a spliced list so you can bang 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 or you can yeah. use dots right no i know <laughs> uh, can can someone tell me why it expects those dots um it's written for multiple arguments so if you look at the help for in quos in quos accepts dots it accepts multiple arguments Right. Thank you. All right. Okay, so this is to be amended before I upload to the repo. All right, so even though you probably shouldn't use them, I do do some examples of using quo and new quo share. All right, so quo x plus y plus z, you know, you just put in the, uh, the expression and you get a expression and a global, right? And then using new quotient, new quotient is a function that accepts an expression and an environment. 
and we're gonna we get the expression and the created environment, right? All right. So next, like quotients under the hood, right? So, um, so I made a a quotient, super quotient, right here. And then I looked at the class. Well, just to verify a lot of things in the book, right? So I looked at the class and the class is kosher and, and formula. So koshers are really a subclass of formulas, right? And because they are a subclass of formulas, the following things you can observe. Um, they are call objects, right? So if you do a is dot call, is, is call, is underscore call on your kosher, you'll get true. Um, they have a dot environment attribute. So we run this code here, attribute super pusher environment. It tells you this is the environment. And like and you can extract the and uh, the expression and the environment using get expr and and get end, right? So this is you know just some insights into what pushers actually are. All right, so that evaluation. This is the point, right? Um, so tidy evaluation is a form of non-standard evaluation that has three main features, right? Quasi-quotation, which John went over last week, quotients, which we just did in the last slide, last two slides, and data mass, which um, we'll do next, you know, or soon, yeah. All right, so, but kind of that, so, um, before I'm getting explicitly into data mass, I'll just talk about the eval tidy function, which is the function, which is a function that does tidy evaluation, right? So it's well named, right? So it takes two arguments, one of which is a kosher, um, two, and the second is a data mask, right? Which is a data frame, basically. Yeah, but there's some kind of funny stuff to come. But yeah, it's basically a data frame, right? And it's the first place that you look for variable definitions, right? So, um, uh, so I kind of deviated from our data set, the, the Bears data set, because um, I've been using the Palmer Penguins data set to teach all week. So I just stuck with what I know, right? So just by example, I'm gonna do some code to use eval tidy to find the largest penguin by mass in Palmer Penguins, in the Penguins data frame of Palmer Penguins, right? So let's see here. So, and, right, so I don't know if everybody's familiar with the Palmer Penguins data set. So the Palmer Penguins data set is Data set for 344 penguins. Um, each row is a penguin, and there's a column, a variable with a body mass. All right? That's what it is. And I want to find what is which penguin has the largest body mass. You know. Okay, so what I do, first thing I do is I create a kosher using kosher creates. Um, and kosher create, well, it creates, well, it, it, remember kosher takes an expression. So I'll take this expression here to be the max of body mass G. And then I set na.rm equal true because I know that so many penguins have missing body mass, right? And then the environment of the kosher will fill to be the default. And then I go to eval tidy. Um, and I pass in my kosher, and then I use the data mask, which I haven't explained, which is penguins, right? So let me put that back in our studio, just so you can verify. Man. Sorry, where have I put this? Um, Right. 
So that took my Kusha, which most importantly had the expression, and then my data mask was penguins, right? Um, sorry, should I be catching up with the chat here? I think you are uh, getting to what we needed in the chat. So okay. <laughs> we, we were given previews of what you're about to talk about. Okay. All right. Okay, All right. so that's what eval type does. And I feel like the data mask is kind of reveals itself, you know, what it is by that example, right? So the next example he does is replicating width, right? So, um, so how, how, do, how, how does width works, work? So width is a base R function where you can say width, a data frame and then give an expression, right? So we can do, let's say we wanted to find the average size penguin, the average mass penguin, the mean. Um, you'd say mean, you would say with penguins and then you supply this expression here, right? Okay, so in the book, there's an alternate implementation of width with two there's a function, which data, which is going, the data is going to be the data mask, the expression. And then you create a quotient, which you call expression, which is a quotient that contains the expression. And then you eval tidy expression and data, right? So, and then here's the example. Here's the running of with two. So you get the same implementation, right? So you with two penguins, so this penguins becomes the data mask, and this is the expression which we evaluate, right? So the average size penguin is, you know, 4.2 kilograms. All right. So another example is using subset, right? So subset, subset is a function in base R that's kind of like dplyr filter, but I think it only takes one condition. So typically with subset, hmm, sorry, let me just jump ahead. I thought, yeah, all right. So uh, I thought I had to put in an example of subset, right? But I did not, my bad. Okay, so subset two, what does it do? So it takes data, rows is the condition, and I'm gonna, it, uses encore and rows, and then it eval tidy, same, same thing as before. So it eval tidy, we have, so it, it uses, it, 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 it creates a portion name rows out of the expression rows, and, and then uses eval tidy as before, and then there's a stop condition which doesn't apply to us. Um, when in, in, in our example, and then it just uses the uh, bracket to subset, right? So I just use subset two. Here's proof that subset two is used. I just use subset two on penguins with the condition that species equal Adderley, which is one of the three species in the penguin data set. And then I just do table on DF dollar sign species. And just to verify that I only got penguins of that one species. Right, and because in penguins data frame species is a factor, we get counts for the other two species as well, but we only keep the rows where the species is Adelie. Right. All right. So here's so next. We get to pronouns. So one of the features of tidy evaluation. So in the book is it says that the data mask provides two pronouns, dot data and dot n, right? So dot data dollar sign x always refers to x in the data mask and dot n dollar sign x always refers to x in the environment. Um, so let me go here. 
Did I not have the two? Okay, I didn't define my width two. There's no width two here. Oh, boy, sorry. All right, so I define width two. Okay. All right. Oh. <laughs> All right. All right. So I created a data frame. Let's see what this data frame looks like. We have just a data frame with a single um, single entry. All right. Then we use dot data dollar sign x. All right. Um, then the other example, and then all right. All right, so what happened there? So all right, let me, let me go over the steps again. So I have x equal x is one in the environment, and then I create a data frame that has x inside of it, right? Now if I use the data Dollar, dollar sign x, I get two, which is the value of x in the data frame. And if I use dot n dollar sign x, I get one as which, right? So the book says that the data mass provides these pronouns, right? Well, yeah. So, which is kind of strange because you have to supply the data mask. Right, so I don't know. I mean, I supplied this data mask as DF. Right, so so with two, with two is my 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 data frame becomes the data mask. Right, so I definitely didn't provide dot data dot x. So there's really no reason that it should work. In my opinion, if um, data mask is providing those two pronouns, so I think that's kind of misleading phrasing. So I looked it up. So the dot data and dot env are actually exported from our lang. So I think it's more accurate to say that the data mask that our lang exports something that you I can. I think it exports is is mythical. It's another one of these Arlang things. It's really just that the Arlang functions look for the expression dot data. And the thing it exports is just there in order to make R not freak out about it. Yeah, so, well, right. So it's not actually a data frame, right? It's a thing that can act like a data frame. Yeah. Yeah, but, but it is, but it's not in data mask. Right. Yeah. yeah. It's no, it's the thing that's in our line. Yeah. Yeah. It's magic. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but um, so it's not actually a data frame, but they act like them. And certain like so certain things you can't do is you can't take names that data or map. So I think that basically that's like an alias to go find a function or to find. So that data mean is like an alias to go find that name in the data frame if it exists. And dot end means you know retrieve something from the environment with that name. All right. All right. So this is where the chapter start to get kind of well something. Um, all right. So um, yeah. So to get into like. What he what, what he says are practical examples, which I which I can see are, you know, I I I, I can kind of see yourself using it. Um, so so one example he goes into is let's say you want to create, let's say you have a resample function as defined here, which you know gets 
gets uh, a vector sampling a sample of size n from the number of rows and then just subsets to get those particular indices and returns it, right? So you have resampled to start with. Let's say you want to create a new function that resamples and then subsamples in a single step, right? So an approach that does not work. And this approach in the slides, when it was knitting, doesn't work, but it doesn't work in a different way to how it should work, how it should not work in R. So I, I have something going on because of something defined earlier in my uh, presentation, um, causing it. So let me go back to here. Maybe I should open the script. That would be a good use case for local, uh, like making sure you're not using extraneous variables. Yeah. All right, sorry, what a, all right, let me, let me clear up my environment. Oh wait, I need subset two. Where's subset two? Yeah. All right, so this, this code over here does not work and it does not work in the same um, way that the code in the book does not work, right? So we have subset two, which is defined earlier, and then subsample, which is what you might do on the assumption, wait, do I have resample? I don't have resample. Sorry, let me bring my resample. All right, yeah, let me bring my resample. All right, so, so object X is not found. Because it's looking for X, not in the data frame, is it? I'm sorry, where am I? Right, so the problem is that subsample doesn't quote any of its arguments. So cond is evaluated normally and not in the data mask, right? Mm -hmm. Sorry. Should I? <laughs> okay, sorry, just catching up in a chapter. Are you evaluating that second argument before? Oh. Yeah, because it's not quoted. Yeah. So cond being called there, does that should just pass it in though, right? No, it, it's, it's evaluate. So when is X equals equals one being evaluated? I see con, and then that should pass. To it's con. being evaluated the first thing inside the function. Right? So it's subset two. Yeah, let's go back yeah. over it entire studio so we can see all the definitions in one place. Uh, yeah. So sub, so. So cond is going to rows of subset two. And subset two is in quoing rows, but it's it's gonna put it in the environment of subsample and you want it in the global environment. Yeah, so I, I, I wanna go to the mask, go well, to the to the DF. Well well. Yes, but you want it, you want like as it existed in the global environment so that it goes properly into the mask. Yeah. So do you have to do uh, like a bang bang and uh, in quo around cond and subsample? So, so here's, I feel like in subsample, you need either a bang bang 
or bang bang and quo or embrace and i'm trying to wrap my head around which so i think well, yeah, i think it's a bang bang and quo well i guess you could also use embrace for that yeah thing. all right well in the yeah i, th I think it should be uh, so, right so i mean yeah, it's the same thing. that's exactly what we said yeah right, bang, bang, yeah. And quo. yeah Right, so you and quo and then you bang bang. Yeah, so embrace. So you could just embrace con right there instead of the and quo and bang bang again. Okay, yeah. Um, so like instead of, yeah, instead of bang bang, you could hus okay. hug whiskers it? Embrace. Well, okay, so yeah, I did say that A I would hug. embrace and cover it, but I never got around to it, sorry. Um, <laughs> I don't know how well, to but now it. you are. <laughs> well, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so it should be called embrace, not embrace. <laughs> well, but that's not a word. <laughs> yeah, but is en quo a word? Come on now. <laughs> it is now. What has not been a word or missed out tagly? Right, but we should call it embrace, not embrace, because it's only sort of a hug. Okay. But within a function. Anyway, yeah. but what you have in subsample would work. This subsample, well, yeah. he has, right? I mean, it's, it's sure. Wait, yeah. Yeah. So why? <laughs> okay. Gotcha. Right. I mean, this, this is what he's saying is this is the way to do it. All right. Um, so here you go. And, right. So let me come in here. All right, so I'm going to make this. That hey, hey. Cool. Hey, Darren, can, to make me feel better about this, can you do the embrace or, you know, once um, you... Uh, can you tell me exactly what the type? Because I've never used it. Yep. So, get, you, so yep. comment out the end quote bit. Yeah, line 20. Simple. Yeah. You comment out? Yeah. Yep. And then yeah. instead of bang, bang, just wait, rep wait, it on, and double... On. Hold on, hold on. Oh, let's do a Better. best sample. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Ten. And then and get rid of the double, and get rid of bang bang. All right. And wrap pond in two braces. Um, two curly braces, yeah. That. That's is it. it? Yeah. That's it. All right. Let's see. <laughs> Let's see. And then the same thing. I'm gonna cry if this doesn't work. Can't find yeah, where, well, I can't find where it went. Oh, it, okay. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it worked. I think that worked. Did it work? Yeah, well, I'm not sure why these row numbers have these decimals in them. But uh, yeah, that's a problem I had before. Like it was. So, this is still a penguin these days, right? No, it's a, a new. This is a random. This case. new day. I think that has to do with um, subsetting, and you subset the same row twice. Oh. I'm like vaguely uh, remembering oh, those okay. those oh, decimals yeah. from like chapter two or something. Right. So scroll up. So subset is doing. So why drop equals false? Is that what is that the problem? Um, right. Um, that's not the problem, but that's oh. that is what it is. That it's selecting those rows more than once, and so it's auto naming. You can turn in 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 the sampling function. You could do, oh, you have replace is equals true. If you set replace equal to false, then it's only going to uh, subset. Oh, because it's a sample. OK. All right, so yeah, you're correct. The, draws I, probably, the drop was probably right. It was probably OK. Never mind. Drop has to do with um, returning an empty data frame, correct yeah. or wrong? I could be wrong. Yeah, so it's because we're resampling and getting the same row. Replace equal false. You guys, I knew something. 
able to answer. <laughs> Only Wait. took 20 weeks. Wait, why are you surprised? Like, I, I don't get why you're surprised. <laughs> right, but right, but I won't run that because if I no, because then my sample has to be less. That has to be. All right, yeah. I think we're kind of running short on time. I don't want to. <laughs> but all right, our project does work, right? Okay. Something else that he points out is that tidy evaluation handles ambiguity well, right? So here's an example of a function called threshold, which takes a data frame. Like, let's say you want to keep all of your rows where x is greater than or equal to a certain value, right? So you might create a threshold x such that, you know, so what you do is you use subset 2 as before. So you want a subset df where, and then say x greater than or equal to the threshold value, which we name val, right? Um, this can go wrong in two different ways. Um, one is that if val, if, if df has something named val in it, in which case it goes to the data mask first and it doesn't use the val that you supply. And then the second way it can go wrong is that X is in the calling environment, but it's not in DF. So DF does not have a column or you know, a variable called X, right? So these are two situations where you would want to fail, right? But they will not fail because the, the flexibility of tidy evaluation, well, the, you know, the flexibility of the functions as we defined so far, um, actually find a, a fallback scenario, which fallback scenarios, which are not what you want, right? So what does it return, trash? Well, it will return something wrong. Um, so do, um, so that's, let's do it. So let's go. So, okay, so what's the first example? First example is what? All right, so val is in df. So df. The df2 equals data frame. Right, so. Oh, that was a bad example. Let's see what the F2 looks like. All right, so let's say I wanna keep the positive numbers. Right. So if I wanna keep the positive numbers, I might try OX DF2, and I'm gonna say val equal uh, let's see. Well, I want to keep zero above, right? So I wanted to keep at least this second row here, right? Where, where X was greater than zero. But because val exists in it, it's, 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 it's not comparing this 0 0.03 to zero, it's comparing this 0 0.03 to this two, value that in the same row, right? And then, yeah. Um, so I, I don't know if, if, if I would call that trash, but it's something that you don't want. I guess like, what if you don't have a column named Val, then it'll just throw like- And it'll there. work, yeah, right. Well, okay. right, so he's just pointing out two situations in which you would expect it to fail. Well, you know, you, you want it to fail conspicuously. Got uh, it. It's actually going to run. 
All right. So a more robust implementation is he has a function, it's subset two, and then he specifies explicitly that you want dot data x to be greater than dot end val. Right? So case one, we're sorry about this, hopefully. Right? So case one, you create a data frame called no x to test it. And you run threshold with no x and two as a threshold, and it fails. It says column x is not found in dot data. And case two, right, you create a data frame that does have val, just as before, and you run threshold, has val two. Hmm. Okay, but that, that should work, right? So, but, but, but it actually uses the correct val, right? And not the val from the data frame. Right, because it's looking at the value of x, not the value of val. Yeah. Yeah, so these two examples are just showing uh, that it works when you write their function robustly. Yeah. yeah. So, all right, so, all right, so non-standard evaluation and base R. Yes. Um, so, well, so non-standard is anything that's not standard, right? So, um, you know, so he Nailed just, it. right, so he just goes over like two common patterns for doing non-standard evaluation. Um, using sub one, using substitute and evaluation. And then the other one is using match.qual. So let's go into a couple of them, right? So, all right, so what does substitute do? Substitute, all right, can I run an intro? All right, so substitute returns a parse tree for an unevaluated expression and substitutes in any variables bound in end. And eval evaluates an R expression. So, um, so eval takes an expression environment and an enclosing environment. Just kind of glossing over. So just to build up to this example coming here. All right, so how subset is used. All right, so how is subset used, right? So subset is you create a data frame and then you use, okay, so I, yeah, this is, you say subset sample df, a greater than or equal to four, and it gives you all the rows of your data frame where a is greater than or equal to four, right? So how is it implemented in base? Something like this, right? So it, 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 it uses substitute. So let's see. All right, so let's. All right. Hmm. Uh, let me get here. All right, so let me call now. I want a subset sample df a greater than or equal to four. Wait, oh wait, no, I want a subset base. Right. Okay. So what's going on here? All right, what does rows look like? Right, so rows, after this line here, rows is this expression. Then we eval rows, what is data? Right, so we eval this expression in this environment data and quarter end is where we go for even higher level stuff, any, any names higher level, right? 
So let's see whether it's valid. Right, so it's false, false, false. So the two rows, the last two rows where A are greater than four, you get the trues. Right, so before we run it, we can just. Hmm. Right, so this is the next line that's going to be run, which is data using the indices, indices from Roseval and then drop equals false. Right, so I'll just stop here. Um, right. So that's just another way to do it. Well, uh, you know, another, an example of a non-standard evaluation using substitutes and eval, which are base R functions. All right, so a couple of problems with subsets. Um, it always evaluates rows in the calling environment. But if dots are used, then the expression might need to be evaluated elsewhere. Um, this means that you cannot reliably work with functionals like map or apply. Second problem is that calling subset from another function requires some care. You have to use substitute to capture a call to subset complete expression and then evaluate. I did not quite fully understand that argument. Well, but I believe it. And then the third problem is that eval doesn't provide any pronouns. So there's no way to require part of the expression to come from the data. Right, and then here's the alternative to subset using tidy evaluation, which is straight from the book, subset tidy. Um, you know, you do a function data rows, you end quote rows first thing, then you do the eval tidy, so anchor rows gives you a quotient. Then you use data as your data mask. And everything is fine. Everything works. All right. So let's come back here. And we subset tidy. Sample DF. Let's say A less than four. Right? Um, all right, we have nine. Let me try to get quick. All right, so then the other way that he goes over is to use match.call, which is something like um, match.call before today was just a function that I copy and pasted from Stack Overflow on a couple of occasions. So I just thought I'd go over like what it actually does, right? So it returns a call in which all of the specified arguments are specified by their full names, which was kind of cryptic, but I ran at some examples, right? So I have a function, my func, which is just consists of a call to match that call. So I create my func with two inputs, input one and input two, and then match.call, right? So when I do my func, it just input one equal one. The return is my func input one equal one. If I do my func with input two equal one and then two, it returns function here. All of the arguments with their full names, right? So it fills in the name for input one, right? And then if I call my func with a function, with, a, with an input name that doesn't exist, it gives me an error, right? Unused argument, error. So that was kind of helpful to me to actually understand what match.call did. So as a kind of background. All right, John, so, did you use match call in that formals function? for that shiny app? Is that how you're getting the formals or not at all? We used the um, Arlang equivalent. Got it. Which I can't remember the name of off the top of my head. 
Well, it's weird because in the book he says there is no Arling equivalent to match call, and I want to be like Hadley. Do you even know your own functions? <laughs> Like, didn't we do something with Jake's shiny thing that yeah. was, like, literally match call? Like, is it one of those things that, that maybe came out, like, after the book? Like, did Probably. They have- yeah. Probably. Uh, call standardize is what it's yeah. called. Yeah. Thanks, right. Tony. All right. So, how, how, how would you use match call in non standard evaluation? So, the steps are, yeah, sorry for anybody running late. Um, two minutes over. Um, all right, so what you do is you capture the complete call, modify it, and then evaluate the results, right? So surprisingly, write.csv apparently uses this, which, you know, well, it's good information, I suppose. Um, but it's, it's, it definitely surprised me. So how does write.csv work? Um, let me move this zoom bar, because it's always in the way. Um, right, so how does write.csv do? There's a, it, it, it captures the call using match.call. And then it, well, let's see. And then it sets the, the, the first element of that list to be the expression, um, write a table. And then it, it, then it sets the, the separator to the comma and what does DEC do? I don't know. Oh, wait, hold on. Did I? All right, something just happened there. Sorry about that. Um, and then it calls the eval call like this. But then he's quick to point out that this is bad. Well, it's unduly complicated because it could have been written like this, right? Could have just take on the dots and then pass those dots to write dot table and then specify sub equal comma and deck equal dot, which is how I had always thought that write dot CSV works. But that is not the case. Do we get to any part where we talk about where to put the dots or is that an earlier section? Like, you know, do we put set and deck before the dots or after the dots? Does it matter? Um, hmm. Well, let's see. I think it was like, like maybe the more uh, like necessary stuff would go before the dots. Yeah. Um, right. Well, no, no. Well, well, um, well, the necessary stuff has well. Hmm. It does is whatever is left. Not sure if it was covered or not. I feel like <laughs> dots is always like at all. Like yeah. whatever. Garbage. Like <laughs> <laughs> No, well dots is whatever is not specified. So um but if you name something, it's named, right? Then that wins. Like a named argument always wins. And the, and the thing is the before the dots are things that can be passed positionally. Right. Mm, okay. And if it's named after the dots, then you have to call it by name. You can't. You run away. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That 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 makes sense. If it's after the dots, you have to call it by name. And, and also, if you normally pass in dots and don't normally pass in these default arguments. You put the dots first because otherwise you would have to specify the arguments for other things to count as dots. Oh. Okay. Yeah, that's kind of how I think about it. Like, um, yeah. Yeah, like I just go. I feel yeah. like we need to build something dotty. Like, I just need to see dots being passed around more often. Okay. All right. Um, all right. And then, then he goes into like wrapping modeling functions, which are a, a common use of tidy evaluation. Um, so the simplest possible wrapper is just to have like a LM2, so you know, simplest modeling function. Well, I guess the most omnipresent modeling function is LM, right? So 
Let's just paste in the simplest wrapper ever with LM2. Right, so LM2 is a function. It takes a formula and data and passes them both into LM. And then run LM2 and you get an output, output that looks just like LM, right? But this is not good enough. This is welcome to LM3, which is a better wrapper function. Can I ask a dumb question? How is this output different from the one that he said wasn't as good as this? Okay, well, how is it different? Well, they look exactly the same, or am I okay. missing something? Well, well, LM, okay, I can tell you how it's different. I don't know how it's better. Um, so, LM, so LM, so this piece here repeats, but he thinks it's better to have this line above it. Oh, because you're not getting the, whatever you call it, your coefficients. Yeah. Uh, because the formula is kind of opaque. Yeah, that's why. Yeah. The formula is kind of opaque. Formula is formula. Right. Okay, that, that clarifies my own confusion. Right, so you actually get the names here. All right, so three things to note. Um, all right, no, well, no, no, things to note. There are three key steps, right? One is to capture the unevaluated argument using an expra and capture the caller environment using caller end. And then two is to generate a new expression using expra and unclosing. And then the third step is to evaluate the expression in the caller environment. All right? So that happened, right? So this is the step three. This is the second step here, right? And then an extra, this, this, this is step one. This is step two. And this is step three. Right. And then, then he mentions like the nice side effect, which is that unquoting can be used to generate formulas, right? So I use an example here. I say y equal um, like bill length in millimeters, which is a parameter in the data set of the penguins. And then I have, and then there's a body mass and then there's the species, right? So let's say if I want to do a regression on a variable y in terms of two variable x's, you know, to be determined. So I, I can do, right, so I can use y is, you know, cap, you know, capture the expression for each of those and then use unquoting to call LM3 our superior LM. And even though it's not in the call, none of the variable names are in the call, you get all the information you can possibly want. Why is this cool? So that you can like loop through different Y's or something? Yeah, or like different combinations of X's or, so like, I guess if you want to, um, well, let's say if you fix one Y, like you want to find like the best model in terms of two different X variables, maybe. Yeah, I guess that makes sense. So like iterate over every combinatoric of every yeah. model. Yeah, yeah. So this is right. If if right, let, let let's just say you had a restriction that you wanted, you know, two independent variables and one dependent variable, you could cycle through them. But but that's pretty abstruse. And I have not, not, I can't recall ever being in a situation where that, well, I mean, maybe it will come up tomorrow. I'll say, I, I did it today. <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> after reading the chapter. I have uh, done something like that, but I built out the formulas beforehand, so it didn't involve uh, like having to replace with the bang bang. And yeah, I guess I was thinking of it more abstractly, like I'm going to create a function that can do this so that I can do it at work all the time, given a bunch of different data sets. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Um, hmm. So like, I guess you could do it. You could, you could also do that with, 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 with the data, I believe, right? You can unquote. Yeah, I think right. you, you could. Uh, right. Yeah. Is that necessary so, though? You just assign any random data set to a DF variable. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah, to get the name of the data set, I guess. Yeah. So, yeah. like, you know, um, hmm. Um. You know, like, I mean, where I used to work, we used to get like data monthly. Maybe I would like to update it with the new, I don't know. That's kind of contrived. Right, that should work. All right. Um, and then another potential problem situation is like mingling objects is like, what if you want a function that resamples before training the model, right? So he gives an example of something that doesn't work Right, so creates a quotient. No, no, doesn't create a quotient. Um, create a formula. Well, get you know, get the formula. Um, resample the data from the resample function. Then use your LM call. Right, so this formula is passed in. Xprint is just to be verbose, and you evaluate. When you run it what happens is that resample data is not found, right? So inside here, when you get to LM call, it's not found. And LM call and resample data are not in the same environment. I believe that was what he said. I don't remember exactly. I, I, look, I was trying to figure it out, but yeah. So that doesn't work. And then he gives two approaches that do work. So DF is just created. Yeah, sorry if you can't see the constant, right? So we sample LM using the NXPRA and unquoting. You can get formula, resample data, very resample. Then you can do your LM call. Now, and you can get your resample data by unquoting. Accessible. And then your eval LM call in the environment that was passed in, the call environment. And then here's the even better approach, which is to create a new environment that inherits from the caller, bind the variables that you created inside the function to the environment. Um, I didn't get this one, but sorry. I like this more than the prior one because it's obvious to me that you're saying like, I want to put the environment of the function as the same environment of resample data. Right. Uh, okay. Now that you put it that way. Um, right. So here he goes. So this one here. So you get the formula, resample data, right? And you create the LMNs specifically and you say resample data, right? So um, does, does the EXPR, does that tell it that it should be in this environment somehow? How, how does the EXPR 
tell it that it needs to be an LM environment. Anyway. It's not there. It's in the eval statement. You're doing the LM call with and saying I want it in the LM environment. I believe. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I see that. Okay. I didn't go that far. <laughs> it's hard when you're reading line by line and you don't want to go to the next line till you understand, but you got to kind of ruin the punchline. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's just get a new expression. All right. So that looks clean. All right. So we're like 16 minutes over time. All right. Let me get to the ending. Um, so yeah, um, in the end, what I took away from this chapter was that there are many ways to do non-standard evaluation, but tidy evaluation is the best way that I have seen thus far. And um, well, all of my experience with non-standard evaluation comes from this chapter of the book. So I may be unduly biased by the content of the chapter. I guess my holistic question after this chapter is like, I'm trying to read this book and be like, at the end, I read this book, you know, like cover to cover, we did yeah. it. But I do not feel comfortable with substitute at effing all. And I feel like that's okay because of tidy eval. Like I have other ways out or do, or should I struggle with this, that heinous slide you had that was like, quotes from the book of like in order to um subset you have to call substitute like, okay wait so um yeah yeah just all right so which in a slide exactly not it, there was no code on it this one like this whole slide is trash noted <laughs> Not, not, not because of you. This is these are not your words. It's, yeah. I mean, I would, it's very hard for me to wrap my head around these things. And I'm just asking you all, like, how much should I be banging my head against the wall with this when I can just use all these other great functions that are now in our toolbox? Right. So, like, I think that that's the point, right? Like, it's that there is no... Well, prior to ID evaluation, there was only this. Well, I think I think stuff like this is Hadley like arguing his case that yes, technically you can do all this in base R, but you don't. Yeah. Um, right, right. It's so dangerous, to me, and it's you know uh, substitute does just everything. So how are you possibly going to remember what it does? Like, um, is there a point as a programmer where you're like, oh, I don't want to use Rlang because I want to reduce dependencies in my package and be fancy. And that, like, like are badass people just not bothering with Rlang and I'm just basic and I need it? Uh, I, I've actually had that issue where it's like, I couldn't use Rlang on, like, some server. But I think that's a, that's a DevOps problem. If you can't use, like, RM or, like, some other environment management tool, then... Mm -hmm. That's a different problem, I think. <laughs> I okay. have been playing with trying to make kind of minimal packages for some things because I have some stuff that's going to be running on uh, uh, Amazon uh, Lambdas and you want the server to be as small as it can be, yada, yada, yada. But even then, like, our line is just so good. <laughs> so a lot of times I end up, like, I'll, I'll rewrite, like, five functions from Arlang and then be like, no, just no, I can't, you know, I'll get to something that's too hard to rewrite and I just use it. So I'm kind of thinking on my yeah. programming journey, once I don't have to brute force my way through expert and expert quo, you know, just like brute force <laughs> right. trying things, then maybe then I can graduate to trying to learn what the hell substitute does because it does <laughs> a lot of things. <laughs> but part of the point is, like he says here, like you got to be really careful when you're using the base ones because some of the base ones, some things about the base ones are uh, not as, um, either not as flexible or not as like safe as the Arlang stuff. Arlang makes sure that the arguments are the, are what you expect them to be. Mm -hmm. um, and base some of these base ones are kind of fast and loose about that. 
Got it. What's the R-Lang equivalent of DPAR substitute? Just NQO? <laughs> Uh, yeah. does it depend, right? Like, cause yeah. that's that's one that is still used. D part substitute. Because I see <laughs> that in intermixed with R lang stuff. Like people, that's like the last vestige that people still use. Well, I'm trying to remember. Guilty of charge. Tyler, you used it in that R markdown shenanigans I was asking about. <laughs> I don't know. Does it like is there a direct one to one replacement for that, or like like if if uh, what you're deparsing and substituting is a list, do you get the same result as like a vector? I don't know. I haven't played around with that enough. Asking the hard questions like usual. Well, I'm literally. I will, because I literally have 15 questions on this chapter. I'm not going to ask them now because it's late. 